Everybody's good and awake? Ready for the word of the day? Yeah. Absolutely. Man. Front row's good. Front row's good? All right. <laughs> rest of you guys, we're just going to have a party up here. You guys can join if you want to. Father God, we thank you for today. Lord, we just take a moment to pause and to say we love you. Lord, this season, so many times we get lost in the shuffle and the things that are going on. But Lord, today we just want to breathe. And thank you. Thank you that you sent your son here to earth so that we could gain access into your presence, Father. So Lord, guide us through the word today. Meet with us today. Give us something that we can grab a hold of, that we can take with us, that we can use in our life, Father. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Um, I was really thinking hard about what direction to go with this. And, and you know, for me, traditional services are hard to do. I'm just not one of those traditional kind of guys. And I was talking to different pastors around. I said, what are you going to preach on? Oh, we're going to do the Christmas message. And, and I said, well, okay, I, I can do that. Uh, but I began to look and I say, you know, we need to back up and we need to remember and we need to know what happened and what was going on and all those things. But it really hit me, let's put ourselves into the situation. Let's take and let's set ourselves back onto a day over in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. It says it's the sixth month of the year. The sixth month of the year, I'm going to paraphrase it. You guys can look it up. We're going to go from 26 through 39 of Luke chapter 1. What happened here is an angel appears unto a young girl. And gives her a word. Now this is the most unlikely person in the most unlikely place. Because this was in Nazareth. Nazareth were the worker bees. Okay? They were the, they were the other side of the track people. Do you understand what I'm saying? They were not the wealthy folks. They were not. These were the commoners. And this angel appears to Mary and says to her, that you're beloved by God. God has set you aside and loves you so much, He's chosen you to do a special duty. He puts a word inside of her and gives her direct word from the throne of God. I don't know about you, but I'd be scared to death. First off, the angel shows up. And if you start seeing angels, they're going to put you in a padded room and run some tests on you for a little bit to see if you're, if you're nuts or what's going on. But she has to go through this process and the angel of the Lord says to you, you are going to have a child. I'm going to have you do something that is impossible in yourself. Because she turns around and says what to him? How can I have a kid if I've never known a man? In other words, I, she says, I'm a virgin. I've never had sex before. How in the world am I going to be pregnant? How many of us, when we get a word, the first thing we do is make an excuse on why I can't work? We get that word from God and we say, oh, that can't happen. I don't have what it takes to make it happen. But I want to submit to you today that the word of God to you is enough to make it happen. Don't let that catch up with you. Everything you need to fulfill that call is wrapped up in the word that God gave you. Pastor Frank and I were talking yesterday, and this statement hit me. It'll take place, and your miracle will take place in your life, and the call will take place in your life when your confidence matches your call. When we get to the point that Mary got to where Mary says, okay, if you say it, let it be. Her confidence in what God told her matched what God told her. So many times we keep wrestling with these calls and we keep saying, I can't do that, God, I don't have enough money. I can't do that, God, I don't have enough time. I can't do that, God, I'm not skilled enough. I can't do that. All God has asked you for is to be available. Just be 
available. Because if he needs something, he can give you what you need to carry it out. How does he move here on earth? Can God just show up and do anything he wants to do? Trick question. No. Because he chose at one point back in the garden to give you and I dominion here on earth. He put us in charge. And he says, I choose to give you my power on earth. That's why in the prayer it says, whatsoever is loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Not whatever is loosed in heaven will be loosed on earth. We have to do the loosing. We have to do the... So God needs us to say, yes, God, I'll do it. Now, the Word also says, if you say no long enough, the rocks and stones will cry out. It'll happen. That's right. It'll happen. But how much better would it be if you choose and say, I'll do it? If Mary that day would have said, nah, you know, I'm not interested. I'm busy. i got other things to do. Would Jesus have ever been born? Yes, he would have, because God would have found another. God would have found another. I don't want God to have to find another in my life. I want my confidence to match my call. Now, the key to that is, what is my confidence in? If my confidence is in my own abilities, then I'm filled with pride, and I'm thinking more of myself than I ought. As the Word says, don't let a man think more of himself than he ought to think. So that confidence that I have, that surety that I have, that we can do this, is not wrapped up in my strengths and my abilities. Because what would have happened, Mary got the Word. And for some people, I apologize if you think this is sacrilege, but I'm just going to, we're going to throw some ideas out there for a minute, and we'll pull it back in. But what happens if Mary gets a word that says, you're going to have a child blessed by God, and she says, great, i got to hold the word, and she goes and tries to make it for herself. She was engaged, so she runs home and says, Joseph, God wants us to have a baby. Full obedience to what God says. Full obedience. Don't try to make it happen in your own strength. That's putting your confidence in the wrong place. Putting your confidence in the wrong place. And a lot of things happened in this young girl's life. Right after she found out she was pregnant, it says she went to the hill country. She went and found Elizabeth, who believed in her. Believe the report that God had done for her. And she found somebody that could nurture her and teach her and train her instead of hanging out with naysayers. Somebody that believed in that dream, that believed in that thing that was inside of her and says, you know what, I can nurture that. I can help that. We can do that. And there was a team of people that came around her. Do you realize that most of the things that are going to happen in your life, most of the miracles, most of the calling, is not a one-man show? It's not a one-man show. There's no such animals as lone rangers in the kingdom of God. We need each other. Mary needed Elizabeth. Needed her. Mary needed Joseph to get on board. Now, I mean, let's think about Joseph for a minute. Your fiancé comes to you guys and says, Hey, man, love you, mean it, but I'm pregnant. And it's God's. Wow. I mean, have you ever thought about this? Joseph, at that point, according to law, could put her away. Have her committed. Done. She would have never been able to marry. She would have never been able to just, whoop, away. But the angel of the Lord appears unto him and confirms the word that the angel had given to Mary. So he has to make a choice. 
Do we see a theme happening here? The miracles of God are relied on your choices. Mary made a choice to receive the word. Joseph made a choice to receive the word. Elizabeth made a choice to receive the word. It says that Elizabeth, she was pregnant. You guys know the story about Elizabeth. Elizabeth couldn't get pregnant. Elizabeth was the mother of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ, or he was the one that announced Christ's coming. All right, he was odd. He was an odd bird. He didn't dress like everybody else. He didn't eat what everybody else ate. And there's a whole sermon there we can do. He was not traditional by any means. He lived out in the wilderness by himself. And then all of a sudden people started getting drawn to him. And he began to preach the coming of Christ. And then he was chosen to baptize Jesus and launch him into his ministry. Because right, the very last thing that happened before Jesus went into the wilderness to be tested was what? John the Baptist baptized him. And the Lord opened the heavens and said, This is my beloved Son. That's what the whole test was about when you go through. See, I can go a whole bunch of different ways here and preach a whole bunch of different stuff. I'm going to rein it in here, all right? But the, 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 this whole miracle was relied on your choice. The one choice that each of these people made to join in and be part of this team. Do you realize that one thought, one decision can change the world? Whether it's the big world or whether it's your old world. One thought can change everything. I would have liked to have been hanging out with Robert when he decided to run for public office. I would have liked to not, not heard what he said. I'd like to have been in here. Because one decision changed. Yeah, it would have been a crazy place to be. I would have definitely had been armed. The one decision had changed the last two years. And it's going to change the future too. But he makes a decision and he signs a piece of paper that says, I want to be on the ballot and considered it for... And the entire world changed. He's had more spaghetti and meatballs than he knows what to do with. Hallelujah. Sometimes, three and four times a day, and I'm not exaggerating, shaking all kinds of hands, meeting all kinds of people, having a lot of people ask for favors. Everything changed off of one decision. Life will never be the same off of one decision. Tomorrow is my anniversary, 29 years. 29 years ago, my life changed off of one decision. When I was standing at the altar and said yes to my wife. Even though everybody around me was saying, you're stupid, man, run. Not because of Etika, I was 19 years old. She was 18. They said, kids, it'll never work. It's been a long never. Here we are. But we had a word. We had a word from God that we were to be together. See, that word came to us. We were on a, 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 a trip with our youth group. A bus trip going to um, Atlanta, Georgia. To, to a youth conference with Dwayne Swilley. And we're on our way to this conference. And I had just come through and just... One of those things, you know, when you're young like that, you know, your heart breaks over everything. Well, I was heartbroken. And it physically hurt. You ever had a heartbreak that physically hurt? I mean, it physically hurt me. And I said, God, I don't have time to waste with this. I do not have time to waste with the relationships. So when I put my arm around the girl that's supposed to be mine, make my pain go away. 
That was my fleece, if you will. So we were there, and, and our youth group was one of those. We laid hands on everything and prayed for everything. I mean, you know, it was just that season. We were praying for it. If it moved, we prayed for it. You know, slap hands on oh, You know, we learned young how to do this thing, right? So somebody walked up to me and said, Eddie is having a problem. Would you go back and talk to her? Now, Eddie and I were friends. We went to school together. Everything was great. And it was one of those people I said, I'll never date her. We're too good of friends. So I went back, and, and I started to pray for her. I put my heart around her, and my heart stopped hurting. And I went, no. You missed this one, God. So I said, another fleece? You ever done these fleece things? God, if this is you, have Sean, my best friend in the world, have Sean come up here and tell me we make a good couple. And if that idiot didn't stand up that second and walk back and say, no, you two make a great looking couple. And we blame him this day <laughs> for putting us together. If you follow me on Facebook at all, you'll see me send messages to Sean every once in a while. Tomorrow will be one. That was my word. And nobody could talk me out of it. That was... The fact. Doug, you know, yeah, yeah, no, come on. She's from Anmore. <laughs> Those of you who've lived here a while understand. That's the other side of the tracks. But you know what? I loved her. We were best friends. And you know what? We didn't date. I took her on one date before we got married. And I took her to the movies, and the movie we went to see, I didn't know, was Beverly Hills Cop. And Eddie was raised in the Nazarene church. We didn't make it through the first scene. Because you guys know Eddie Murphy's in that, and he has this tendency of spreading things, you know? And she was like, oh my God, I can't do this. So the only date we had prior to us getting married was we had Wendy's and about three minutes of a movie. I was, I was you know, I was still in high school. I couldn't afford anything else. So I blew all that cash on him. I'm going to take her out. <laughs> Don't appreciate me when I spend. So we didn't, we didn't date. We didn't do any of the normal things that you want to say. Our dating took place in our youth group. Every time I would go to minister somewhere, I would go pick her up. And she would sit on the front row and look at me with those lovely eyes as I would preach. And then she would sing, as I'm laying hands on people, I told her, I said, you need to learn to play the piano so you can be a real pastor's wife. <laughs> and we just loved each other. And that word and that dream that I had was given to me because of one choice. Because of one choice. Now, she kind of had to agree with that choice. Because if I was the only one that chose that, I would have been arrested for stalking. Right? So there has to be some agreement. It took more than one to make this miracle happen. And right before we got married, we were sitting on the steps outside of her house. And she started to cry. So what's the matter? She said, I can't marry you. I'm sitting there trying to, I'm freaking out. I'm like, what in the world not? She said, my doctor says I can't have kids. Because when Etika was born, she was born with all of her intestines on the outside. When she was born, if you ever get a chance to hear her testimony, it'll blow your mind. They told her parents, don't name her. It's just a waste of time. And... Right after birth, within 24 hours, she had her first surgery. And the doctors told her, because of that, you'll never have children. She said, I can't marry you. Because I know how much you want to be a dad. And see, so many times in our life, ourselves or our enemy will try to rob us of the dream. And we'll find reasons in ourselves 
why that can't happen. So I put my arms around her and I said, we'll adopt. I don't care. And we sat there and we prayed and we fought for it. And we had been married for a couple of years and we got pregnant and she lost it. One of the toughest moments of our marriage. Because at that full point, she said, I'm a complete failure. It'll never happen for us. Why did I do this? We went through all of that stuff. And then we got Lauren. The gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Be perfect, daughter. Because she is my perfect daughter. My only daughter, but my perfect daughter. And I, last night we were watching Abigail, and I said, Welcome to raising yourself. Because Lauren was exactly like Abigail. Full tilt, all the time. Lit up the room. Nobody cared if Etik and I showed up. Everybody wanted Lauren. That's just the way it was. You know, and, and, and when we would have people over to the house, we had these hardwood floors in the house, we would hear these little feet. We'd say, Lauren, back into bed. And it, she had to be in the middle of everything. <laughs> Something could never change. Everything that was going on. Our gift. Our second child was born. Benjamin Matthew. I named Benjamin Matthew when I was 14 years old. When I was 14 years old, I began to pray for my kids. And I began to pray for my son. And Benjamin Matthew means son of the right hand, a gift from God. And I began to pray for that boy. And pray for that boy. And pray for that boy. And now I'm still praying for that boy. <laughs> pray for that boy. Love that boy. And then there was Mikey. Mikey came along at a point in time when the doctor looked at me and said, you're going to die by the time you're 25. My health had deteriorated to that point. I was, at that point, about 600 pounds or so. My metabolism had shut clear down and wasn't working. It was, didn't work at all. I'd gone for magnetic treatments. I'd gone for all these things. And the day I had my surgery, for sleep apnea. Back in the day, before it became the GQ disease that everybody has, they used to do throat surgery on you. Now they call it butchering. <laughs> but back then, that was the answer. So, I had just come through surgery, and Etika can't figure out why she's, in the, why she's nauseous and throwing up and sick and everything, and then all of a sudden she went, oh my God. So the day that surgery took place was the day we found out that Mikey's coming. Here comes Mikey. And our dream was beginning to develop. But when they did the C-section on Mikey, Etika felt everything. The epidural didn't work. And the anesthesiologist didn't believe her. Didn't believe her. She hemorrhaged for three and a half hours after surgery. The enemy tried to take her from me that that battle that we fight to keep the dream alive. I left the, emer or the operating room after we got Mikey into the nursery. I went, and I went to find the anesthesiologist. I found him. The doctor had him by his throat, literally, and was threatening his life. And I was like, he's lucky he found you first. So then I went back to the room, and... I'm sitting there, I said, I, I want my son. Bring me my son. My wife's down in recovery. So they bring me the wrong kid. Oh, my <laughs> I'm not going to say which hospital. It, it was not in this county, though. They brought me the wrong child. Because when we moved into that room, there were two of us in that room. There was the Sands family, and there was the Sanders family. 
<laughs> you don't, all you have to do is take a look at Pat Paul's pictures. He's out. Right. And I went, this is not my kid. These are all threats to the dream. These are all threats to, to where you're going. Then when I finally got my kid and counted his fingers and toes and realized that, okay, he's a complete, we're good. I sent him back to the nursery and I started out down the hall. And the nurse said, where are you going? I said, I'm going down to recovery. He said, you can't go down there. I said, stop me. <laughs> stop me. And at that point in time, I had lost about 80 pounds during the period. So I'm still over 500 pounds. I'm like, go ahead, girlfriend. I'll break you like a twig. <laughs> and downstairs I go. And I'm standing outside thumping on the door of recovery. And finally somebody walked by and said, what's going on? I said, my wife's been down here for hours. And I didn't know what was going on. And I found out she'd been hemorrhaging. They almost lost her three times. It was a real mess. And I finally got inside. And I got to lay my hands on her and pray for her and say, God, this is my gift. Don't take her. And I brought her home. And when I look at this story in my life, I look at how many times the dream was tried to be taken away from me. How many times that it was trying to be removed. And even when I follow the story of Mary and Joseph, many times the dream was tried to be removed. Because you remember that uh, that, uh, that at that time they found out that there was a king born, right? So they put out a decree to kill them all. To get the dream. But Mary and Joseph ran to Egypt to protect the dream. Sometimes you have to do whatever it takes to protect that thing that God's asked for you to do. And, and people say, but Doug, I don't look at my dream. My dream has been since I was a little boy to be nothing more than a pastor. When they would ask us, what do you want to be when you grow up? Everybody else wanted to be a cop or be a fireman or be, I want to be a pastor. That's all I ever wanted to be. That was it. And if I watch and I look through and I see what happens. When we started this church 10 years ago, Mikey was just starting to learn to play guitar. Ben was just starting to learn to play drums. Lauren was attempting keyboard at the time. There was my worship team. And Mikey's grown. And I was able to come off the guitar and do other things. And all this. And every portion of Eddie and I being together. Now, we have Oasis, which I don't know we could have ever had. Because each one of my kids has played a vital role in making this happen. My wife, Lord knows that Oasis Worship Center could not function without my wife. Because I don't have a lot of people beating my door down to go take care of the ankle biters. You know what? Because a lot of times when the parents come in here, you're tired. You want a break. Hallelujah. I understand. But there's not a lot of people that jump in there and take a hold of that thing the way she has. Man, what a huge, 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 huge blessing to have. All of these things, and it was all based off of a decision that was made 29 years ago. 29 years ago. And we fought to protect it. One decision will change the rest of your life. For some of you, and for well or early for all of us, the decision to follow Christ was a decision that changes the rest of your life. If you haven't made that decision, what a better season to do it than in this time of Christmas. Because this season that we celebrate now, God sent His only Son here to allow us to have access back into His presence so that I can be called a child of God. 
And you know what? I, I don't. I thank Mary for that. Because you know what? She made a good decision. She made a good I'm, I'm glad I don't have to pray to her. But I'm glad she made the decision. Joseph gets lost in the whole picture. You know, we don't hear a whole lot about Joseph after, you know. But he had to raise this boy. I mean, you guys, you guys think it's, you know. Think for a minute having to raise Jesus. The Son of God. How do you spank that thing when he's out of, out of line? You think he ever got out of line? Sure he did. He decided to not follow and listen to mom and dad. He stayed at the temple and they left. And I, we read the story. They come back, oh, Jesus, where are you? No! There was a crazy demon-possessed mama that went in there and grabbed him by the nap of the neck and said, boy, we want to think all pretty. Well, what happens if you were on vacation somewhere and you get halfway down the road, you're, two, what, three days into the journey? And you go, where's Dominic? And you get back there and say, I just wanted to stay and hang out. No, 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 no. I promise you that boy's not going to sit down for a while. <laughs> Mary said to her, at that point, I believe, I'll tell you when you can be about your father's business. How do I know that? Because at the wedding of Cana of Galilee, he asked Mom. And Mom said, it's time, go ahead. Be about Dad's business. I'm grateful for the decisions they made. Because of their decision, I'm here today. I'm grateful for the decision. You know, sometimes the decisions that we make and the things we do don't always work out exactly the way we have them planned. I used to talk to my mom because, you know, she never remarried after my dad. My mom and dad were married for 13 years. Four kids. And there were many times she would apologize. I'm sorry you grew up with the eyes of dad. I'm sorry you grew up, you know, those kind of... And at one point in time, I looked at her and I said, Mother, I'm glad you married my dad. Because God needed Pat and Ed to make duck. You might have looked at it as a bad thing, but I'm glad you did it. <laughs> I'm kind of appreciative you made that decision. And you know what? The skills and the abilities that I have, came not just from my mom. They came from my dad. My dad had some rough edges. He passed away about a year and a half before my mom, maybe two years. My dad could sell an Eskimo snowball. He was what's known as a retail troubleshooter. Rose, you remember Hills, the store Hills, up on Bridgeport Hill? Hills at one point in time was in trouble, was going to go out of business. They sent my dad in, put it back on his feet. That's what he did all the time. We never lived in a place more than two years. People got to send him in. So he worked for Hills and Hex and those older chains that don't exist anymore. And they would send him in. And what he would do, he would go in and fire everybody. They called him the hatchet man. And then he would take applications at a table right outside the door. And unless there was major discipline and things like that in your file, he hired everybody back except the management team. And he always said the store wouldn't be in this shape if the manager did their job. Never hired the manager back. He put it back on his feet. Organizational skills, people skills, like... Nobody could believe. Talented man. I thank God for those kind of skills. Because I got some of those. Musically, my dad, when he sang, people stopped. He was amazing. He had a bass voice that he and my granddad both. People begged to hear my dad sing. Musically, my mom, in worship that she deposited in me, See, God needed all those things to make who I am. He needed those things. But the decision that was made was there. 
And I believe when God chose Mary, He also chose Joseph because He needed the right man to raise His boy. Because what did Joseph teach Jesus? Jesus was known as the son of the carpenter. You know all those parables that Jesus told? Where do you think he learned the principles? He learned them in the carpenter shop, listening to his daddy talk while they were building the chair. While they were doing the things necessary. And because of their willingness to follow this decision, their willingness to grab a hold of the word that God gave them, the world changed. So I'm asking you in this season, with everything that's going on, what word do you need to embrace? Maybe you've already grabbed a hold of it. Maybe you've got a hold of that word already. But see, some of the areas in my life have been challenged. I started saying about maybe two months ago to the leadership team here, we're going to start behaving like a big church. Right? Right? You know why? Because I know the promises that God gave me. I know what He said to me. So why wait until you have it in your hand to start behaving that way? You know, I told you, my Uncle Charlie used to tell me all the time, dress for where you want to go, not for where you are. Get yourself put together, young man. Look good. Act good. You know? I was listening to uh, my, my school lab yesterday, and uh, Dr. Johnson was talking about this woman come up to him and said, I don't understand why I can't find a husband. When Naomi talked to Ruth and was sending, him, sending her to Boaz, to trap him, to get him, what did she say to her? She said, put on your nicest garment and some perfume. Because he's not going to get you if you look all nappy-headed. <laughs> look like you just crawled out of bed. You know, sleep still in your eyes and you walk down there on your coffee cup and say, love you, man. It ain't going to happen. And, and, and they only knew this. She said, clean up. Look good. Hmm. Amazing, isn't it? So my challenge to you is this. You've got a dream. You've got a word from God. Clean up and start acting right. Man, that made it to... Did it make it to the front row? No. Maybe it didn't. <laughs> Clean up and start acting right. Start living like the word's in your hand. Start living... Because you know what? Faith is not needing my five senses to confirm what God said. I don't need to see it. I don't need to smell it. I don't need to touch it. I don't need to taste it. It's there. How do I know it? God said so. Do you think that Mary felt like a blessed woman, highly favored of God? She grabbed a hold of that word and she started acting like it. We can go all the way through the scriptures and see that. Don't wait until your miracle happens to start behaving that way. God said, this is what's going to happen. This is where you're going to be. God prophesied over this ministry when we first started. When we did our dedication service, we had moved into the basement of the bakery at that time. And I'll, I'll, I need to dig out the, the word. But Pastor Leo was prophesying over us. And he said, you're like a weed that sprung up through the driveway. Nobody will ever know where you came from and they can't get rid of you. I was like, I like that word. The word came that said people will come from near and far for the deposit just to have you lay hands on them. You will equip leaders that will change the world. That's the word that came over me. And I was like, I'm just Doug. And God said, you're right. You are. 
Pastor Frank and I have talked a lot about this, getting the confidence level up to match the call. I'm learning to get a hold of what God said about me. I've got that little sticker in my Bible, in one of my Bibles at the house. It's my blue Oxford Bible that I carried when I was a teenager. And you know those little signs, your little stickers you get when you go to meetings that says, Hello, I'm... Well, on mine, a little snot-nosed teenage kid, I went, Hello, I'm Dr. D. This time next year, I will be. Why? So I can have a PhD? Because of a dream. Because people are going to come from near and far to this place, to this ministry, to have laid, hands laid on to be launched into ministry. People are going to come here to be trained. They're going to come here to be taught. They're going to come here to learn worship. Because you know what? When the rubber meets the road, you know what my ministry is? If I had to hang a brand on it? Worship God in spirit and truth. That's me. That's me. You know, if you talk about different pastors, if you talk about Benny Hinn, automatic, automatically you think of what's his ministry? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Teaches on it all the time. Joyce Myers. Living. Everyday living. How to live successful, purpose driven stuff. Alright? You, you, you think of these guys. If you think of Billy Graham, salvation. Okay? It's their brand, it's what they are. When people think of Oasis, I want them to think of worship. Because in the presence of God, there's fullness of joy. I like that word fullness. Because fullness means in the presence of God, there's everything you need. So in this season, I've got my dream. I've got it in focus. I'm going to begin to behave like I'm holding it. What's your word? What's your word? What has God said to you? What's the dream? And don't get spiritual on me. Okay? Don't, 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 uh, you know, I'm, uh, my dream is fivefold. My, no, your, your dream may be to own your own business. That may be your dream. Your dream, Alex, maybe your dream is to be a landlord and, and have a, an empire of homes. 19 years old, starting already. If that's the dream, grab a hold. Because I promise you, there were people that said, why in God's name are you buying a house that you're not going to live in? Are you stupid? Heck no. Boy, smart. He's going to put that house up, and he's going to get it rented, he's going to get income coming off of it. And then you know what? He's going to buy another one. Then you know what? By the time he's my age, he'll play golf every day. Hallelujah. What is that dream? Because God needs it all. You know? You want to be the President of the United States? God help you. I don't know why you'd want that job. But if that's the dream, start preparing for it. What is that business? What is that, that thing? What is that? What do you want to be known for? When they say, Mr. Toothman, what is, instantly are people going to think of? We get that reputation in the world, don't we? When we're in the world and we say, all of a sudden they think of, oh, that guy, he can drink me under the table. They get, what are, but what are they going to be with God? What is that thing going to be that you have a hold of? Now, here's the temptation. Don't allow the enemy or yourself to talk you out of what God said. Because I promise you, here's what's going to happen. You're going to walk out of here, you're going to get in your car, and you're going to say, you know what, I really do want to start that business, and then you're going to start figuring out every reason in the world you can't. I don't have enough education. 
I don't have enough money. I don't have enough. You guys know who Bobby Flay is? Yes. Off the Food Network. You guys know who he is? Do you realize he has a ninth grade education? He is, he is known as being the unbeatable chef. They have a show on there that's called Beat Bobby Flay. Because nobody can beat this guy. And they, he, they, he cooks their food. He used to do those throwdowns where he'd show up at your place and throw down with you and your best dish, and he won most of them. He's the man. He's got a ninth grade education. I'm just here to say this. I'm not saying drop out of school. Because he'll tell you, you need the education. You need the stuff. But don't let what you don't have be an obstacle to what you should have. Just because he didn't finish high school doesn't mean he can't be the best chef. My grandfather, my mom's dad, became one of the best bookkeepers in this area. And he went to the 8th grade. Churches would bring all their stuff to him because he knew tax law and especially church tax law. And he sat in there with the old ledger books. Remember the old ledger books? There was none of this old. And he would sit there with that. Pull that handle down. He's just going to town. And he's got all these books there. And I'm just like, Lord, you've got to be one of the smartest men I know. He said, I don't have an education. He worked at the carbon as an inspector. And when he would go to the carbon, his uniforms were pressed. He wore the, he wore the uniform. And he wore those black and white uh, uh, conductor hats. And Grandma would stretch that hat over a pot. She had a pot that was the exact right size. And she would starch that hat to where it had a flat top. And when he went in there, he looked like he, he was the plant manager. And he was an inspector. People respected him. People talked to him. People asked him. And he was an inspector. That's what he did. So, going into this season, as you are thinking about Christ and you're thinking about these things, what decision do you need to make to change the rest of your life? It doesn't have to be a huge decision. They can be little ones. Maybe there's a behavior you need to change. Maybe there's a behavior you need to start. Maybe there's an education that you need to get. Maybe there's an education you need to stop getting. Hmm. Man, interfering big time now. Live according to the call. Live according to the call. And when that happens, you will never be outside the will of God. You will always be under His protection. Now, does that mean you won't have hard times? Nope. Rain falls on the just and the unjust. You're still going to go through tough times. But the difference is, you're going to know where to go and how to get there. It's called a season beginning and an end. That is not anything that I prepared today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, that's where we went anyway. Love God with all your heart. First responsibility. Second responsibility, be obedient to what He's asked you to do. Pastor, I don't know what He's asked me to do. Well, let's figure it out. Let's figure it out. One thing we know he's asked all of us to do. Go you into all the world and preach the gospel. So next week I'll have some things back in the track rack for you. We have a track rack back there, by the way. Most of the books that are there uh, are little books that were written by Dr. John. But Pastor Frank has been teaching a series on how to share your faith and, and how to witness to people and how to do those, those things. And, and, and he started talking about the Romans Road. And the Romans Road is a walk through Romans that 
teaches us the message of salvation. So uh, while we were doing uh, Wednesday night, we were practicing. Dan got Pastor Frank saved uh, there Wednesday night. He was tough on you, wasn't he? We did this thing. We, we had him write an elevator speech. All right, How are you going to share your faith? And then write a prayer that they could repeat after. And Dan, he tried to close the deal three or four times. Frank just was not biting. You want to pray with me? Well, you know, uh, he finally did, though, didn't he? He, he, finally, he finally folded. I'm telling you, he was, easier, he was easier on little Robert than he was on you. I don't understand what the deal is with that. He was testing the big time. But I've got these tracks that are coming in that are called the Romans Road. And it's going to take you right through every scripture, right through everything you do. If you don't know what your call is and what you're supposed to do, take a stack of those. And every time you minister or talk to somebody, give it to them. If you have the opportunity, walk them through it. It's just not that tough, is it? No. Mm. And as you're doing this, you'll discover your call. All of us are called to share the gospel. All of us are called. Amen? Mm -hmm. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. Lord, I submit it to you and just ask you to add your blessing to it, Lord. And Lord, help us to be willing to say yes to that call. To be, see, to be willing to embrace the dream and to carry it to birth, Father. Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you for the people that are here and those that couldn't be here with us today. Lord, I just pray a special blessing. And Lord, as we go through this season, that you would uh, place a hedge of protection around each person. Lord, not just physically, but Lord, as there's more uh, credit card transactions and all these, protect our identities from identity theft, protect our, our, our finances, protect our reputations, that no harm can come nigh the family of God, according to your word, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. amen.